What's up, Bugdog with Dini in the Garage? Today, we are finally gonna do the history of the Grand Cherokee, uh, and I'm sitting in a Grand Cherokee, so you know it's gonna be good. The history of the Grand Cherokee has five chapters, the ZJ, WJ, WK, WK2, and the WL. We're gonna cover all five of them, starting right now. Chapter one, the ZJ. Now, development on the ZJ actually started in 1983. As soon as AMC released the XJ Cherokee, they started planning its replacement, which was supposed to be the Grand Cherokee. The Grand Cherokee was supposed to replace the Cherokee, not run alongside it. Originally, the ZJ as we know it, Grand Cherokee, first generation Grand Cherokee, was known internally at AMC as the XJC. There are a number of designers who had their hands in getting the final ZJ product to market market, but Larry Shinoda is the one who has credit for designing the ZJ. Now, I need to very quickly correct an injustice. In a previous video, I called him Larry Shinodo, uh, and I was corrected quite vehemently in the comments. Larry Shinoda designs Grand Cherokees. Mike Shinodo wrapped for Lincoln Park. Uh, if you're wondering, that video was on how the ZJ was almost a Dodge vehicle. Yeah, Dodge almost saw the Grand Cherokee and snatched it. I have a link in up in the corner somewheres if you'd like to see that. Back to our story though. The ZJ is actually one of the first vehicles designed entirely in CAD, computer-aided design. And a fun fact is that uh, when AMC was going under, and Chrysler was looking to possibly buy AMC or parts of AMC, it's the plans for the ZJ Grand Cherokee that Lee Iacocca saw that convinced him to buy the Jeep brand. He saw the Grand Cherokee and he said, that's gonna fit just nicely with my little minivan thing I've got going on. To that point, the ZJ was actually ready to go into production in 1989 for the 1990 model year, but Lee Iacocca was not done with his little minivan reshuffling and he pushed it to 93. 1992, the ZJ is released for the 93 model year in probably the most spectacular way you can release a vehicle. They drove it up the steps of Cobo Hall in Detroit through a plate glass window to the Detroit Auto Show. That is how they unveiled the Grand Cherokee and that is why forever and ever the Grand Cherokee is the king of SUVs, end of story. Now it was originally geared to be a semi-luxury competitor to the then very, very popular Explorer and in my opinion, the Grand Cherokee and the Explorer have been uh, competitors for their, for their run and uh, you can see them kind of uh, progress at similar uh, steps. So in 93, when this Jeep is released, it comes with three basic trim levels. You've got your SE, your Laredo, and your Limited. The SE is your base model, and believe it or not, a lot of people don't know this, in 93 and 94, the Jeep Grand Cherokee SE came standard with the four liter and a five-speed manual. Unfortunately, the manual went away, as all manuals do, because of lack of interest. Everybody wants a manual until it's time to buy a manual from the dealership. <laughs> so uh, the ZJ Grand Cherokee had the manual for two years uh, and no Grand Cherokee since then has had it quite a shame. Additionally, early ZJs with automatic transmissions got the AW4 out of the XJ, uh, which was later switched to the A500 and the 42RE, but uh, the 42RE and the A500 are notoriously weak transmissions. So the AW4 that you got in your 93 and early 94s is a much stronger transmission. Eric's 93 has it, and that thing will pull a house off its foundation uh, lethal weapon style. For the early years, the Laredo featured power doors and windows, as well as an automatic transmission standard with the four liter, where the Limited came standard with leather seats and body match cladding with gold accents. That's right, Subaru was not the first one to do gold accents. As far as engines go, the four liter and the 5.2 liter V8 were available for all model years, though unfortunately in 1995, they lost five horsepower and 15 horsepower respectively uh, because of emissions BS. Uh, in 1996 is where things start getting a little more interesting. This is where the limited package really starts getting fleshed out. Starting in 1996, the ZJ Limited came standard with heated seats, fog lamps, skid plates, convenience lighting, and tow packages. So all limited had the tow package, which is pretty awesome. Then of course in 1997 and 1998 is when the ultimate ZJ is created, the 5.9 limited. Now the 5.9 limited is a limited. It came with all the uh, pre-mentioned limited accoutrement, though it also had the 5.9 liter 360, uh, 245 horsepower, 
coupled to a 4.6 RE trans was an absolute monster. To go with that beefy engine and transmission combination, it got functional hood louvers as well as a unique grille and rocker moldings, a low restriction three inch exhaust with a chrome tip, 150 amp alternator, a 180 watt 10 speaker infinity gold sound system complete with the rear roof bar that's mounted to the roof back there. Pretty cool, super 90s. Uh, additionally, it had a unique all leather interior and was named uh, 1998's 4x4 of the year. It was tested and confirmed to be the fastest production SUV at the time, uh, which was a title that usually went to GM as they did those crazy Cyclone and um, Cyclone and Typhoon in the early 90s. Jeep swooped in in the late 90s, and they've pretty much been holding on to that title ever since. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Throughout the ZJ's entire life, it was available with the 242, the 231, and the 249 transfer cases. Now, at the time, the 249 was kind of the star of the show. It was a full-time four-wheel drive uh, that had some issues as it aged, but at the time, it was a very advanced transfer case, and they put that in most of their V8 uh, options, uh, though you could additionally have select track the 242 or the 231 uh, depending it was available all three were available all years it just depended on your trim package tow package uh, which one you got now the ZJ went out of production in 1998 after 1 million 648,188 sold. That's a lot of friggin' Jeeps. That's why you see them all over the place. Uh, and they've been lasting. The last one was rolled off the line in 1998. Here we are in 2020 and you see ZJs all over the place. A fun fact about ZJs uh, and WJs for that matter. ZJs and WJs that were not for the North American market, uh, United States and Canada are uh, labeled ZGs and WGs because instead of being built at the uh, Jefferson North plant, they were built at the Gras Austria plant. So G for Graz. That's a fun fact about the ZJs that you can take to the bank. Grand Cherokee WJs from 1994 to 2004. They were introduced again at Cobo Hall. They didn't drive through any windows this time. Uh, the WJ was a complete revamp of the ZJ. They only shared 127 parts in common, mostly fasteners, lug nuts, and silly stuff like that. Total and complete uh, restart. They got rid of the 5.2 and the 5.9 engine in place of the brand new Chrysler Powertech 4.7 V8, which produced significantly much less torque than its pushrod uh, predecessors. But uh, as an overhead valve, it was much better on gas. And at the end of the day, since it was lighter, it kind of came out about even what you would have with a 5.2. The spare tire for the WJ was relocated from inside the cargo compartment to underneath the floor of the cargo compartment, giving the WJ its signature saggy diaper rear end look. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, look up WJ Tank Tuck. That's the best way to fix that. Additionally for the WJ, they moved from a four and a half by five bolt pattern to a five by five bolt pattern, which would be the norm going forward for their bigger SUVs. But at the time, it was the first one that really did that. All the current um, you know, modern-ish SUVs were doing four and a half by five. The four liter was standard in the WJ, though it was upgraded. A new intake helped it produce an additional 10 horsepower. Originally, the WJ was available with the 242 and the 247 transfer case. That's gonna be your select track, your quadra track two, and your um, Quadra Drive 1. In that lineup, Quadra Drive is by far the star. That's what this particular Jeep right here has. It has the 247 limited slip transfer case and a Verilock limited slip differential in the front and in the back. Two wheel drive WJs for the first two years got true track in the back, which was the limited slip being used during the ZJ years. As far as transmissions goes, if you had a four liter, you got the 4.2 RE, kind of a bummer. We all just have to deal with it. If you had the 4.7, you got a variation of the 4.5 RFE, depending on your year. From 99 to 01 and a half, you got a 4.5 RFE. And then from 01 and a half to 04, you had a 5.45 RFE. The only difference between those two transmissions, the transmission control module. They uh, reprogrammed the transmission control module in 01 and a half to give you an extra overdrive gear. That's what the five stands for in the 545 RFE. Five 
forward gears. Uh, so literally, if you have a WJ that doesn't have the 545, all you need is the TCM from a WJ with the 545. It's it's a direct swap. I was just arguing with someone in the comments about this this morning. Somebody comment, somebody who knows, comment down below and let them know. Now, non-North American market WJs additionally could have a 3.1 turbo diesel from 99 to 02 and a 2.5 CRD diesel from 02 to 05. That's the same CRD that went in the Liberty Great Engine. Why we didn't get it in North America. America, I will never know. Now in 2002, the standard 4.7 is replaced with the 4.7 HO, bumping it up to 265 horsepower and 325 pound-feet of torque. This is done with different cams, different intake, uh, I believe a different tune. There's a bunch of other things that I'm forgetting, but it's the much more desirable motor. It would again be upgraded in 2008, but we'll talk about that when we get to the WK. The most important thing about 2002 WJs, this is the year they introduced the Overland um, trim level. The Overland trim is, of course, a nod to the original Jeep manufacturer, Willis Overland. Uh, it is by far, well, in my opinion, the best model of uh, the best trim level of Grand Cherokee is the Overland. That's the one you want. Another interesting thing about 2002 is the only year where the upcountry suspension package was standard on the Overlands. Right in 2003, they did this thing where they made you could order an Overland, but you could choose whether or not you wanted the upcountry suspension. It was heavier duty with like a one inch lift. And unfortunately, they didn't explain it well to the dealers, so dealers accidentally ordered a bunch of 2003 and 2004 WJs without the upcountry that was meant to have the upcountry. They just checked the wrong box. I guess Jeep made it confusing for them. That is why there is so much confusion in forums about which overlands have upcountry. And it really just comes down to, unless you have an O2, you just have to check your build sheet or get under the Jeep and start looking around. Now, 2003 was a very short production year. They were getting ready for 2004 which would sadly be the final year, but arguably the best year for the Grand Cherokee. Though in 2003, uh, they did introduce child seat latches in the uh, seats, which is awesome. Previously, the one in my Jeep, they're in the ceiling up here, which is weird. Uh, and my 2000 WJ doesn't have them at all. You just have to loop it around the seat. Now, 2004, big year for the Grand Cherokee. It got a facelift. They went to round fog lights as well as a front fascia upgrade. Uh, and there were actually different front fascias for the Laredo Limited and various other other special editions. Speaking of special editions, there is a Christmas tree full of them for the 2004 model year. They had the Freedom Edition, they had the Columbia Edition, they had the Rocky Mountain Edition, and this is all uh, alongside the usuals of the Laredo, the Special Edition, the Limited, and the Overland. Uh, there are just a ton of different 04 Jeeps, and they're all very, very cool. Personally, I am uh, fond of the Columbia and uh, Rocky Mountain. A lot of these are just appearance packages, but I don't know, appearance is important. Gotta look good, look good, feel good, right? Another interesting thing about 2004, this is the only year they offered Quadra Track 1, which uses the 147 transfer case. This is one they would use a lot with the WK. It doesn't have a low range. It's a full-time four-wheel drive, so there's no second stick. There's just the shifter. Uh, I owned a WK with this. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, at the end of 2004, when they stopped selling WJs, they had sold 1 million. 557,859. Again, that's why you see so many today. And 20 years down the line, let's see, the oldest, the youngest WJ existing would be from 04. So uh, 16 years old. The youngest WJ you're gonna find is 16 years old and they've been holding up pretty well. I've got one that's 20 this year, my, my 2000. Obviously, is 20. A fun fact about WJs is that they actually have a much stronger unibody than ZJs and XJs. Uh, this is because of the use of higher grade steel in conjunction with a partnership with Porsche uh, that helped them design a more rigid frame using less material. So it's lighter, but it's stronger. This fact is actually falsely attributed to the Daimler Chrysler merger. They think that um, Daimler came in and told Chrysler, hey, go partner with Porsche or something uh, to, you know, to, on that new Grand Cherokee you're building, but that's not true. The WJ was already ready for market in 1987 when Daimler came in and partnered with Chrysler. Someday I'm going to do a video on the uh, Daimler Chrysler part merger of equals, but not today. Let's move on to the WK. WK Grand Cherokee is going from 2005 to 2010. They debuted in 2004 for the 2005 model year at the New York International Auto Show. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I was at that. I was in like eighth grade. I'm pretty sure I was at that International Auto Show with my mother and my grandfather. So uh, I may very well have seen that. I was not obviously being in eighth grade as into Grand Cherokees as I am today. I was into Wranglers and CJs. Now, just like the WJ was a total shakeup from the ZJ, the WK is a total 
right turn from the WJ. You lose the four liter. Moment of silence. In its place, you get the new Powertex 3.7. This is a very, very, very similar engine to the 4.7. They share all front accessories, timing cover. It, it just has two less cylinders and different cylinder geometry, obviously, because that math wouldn't work out. You still have the 4.7 and you have the optional uh, 5.7 liter Hemi, which is a really awesome uh, addition to put into your Grand Cherokee. Uh, another real sad thing to take away is the solid front axle. Instead, you get a leading arm double wishbone style, just like the KJ Liberty had uh, come out with in 2002. Originally in 2005, it was only offered in a Laredo and a Limited. The 3.7 came standard on the Laredo. It got Quadratrack 1, which we just spoke about. Uh, in this iteration, by the time it gets to the WK, it's using what they call a brake lock system. I actually owned one of these. It's a, it's a very tricky four-wheel drive system. What you have is a limited slip center differential, that's your transfer case, and then two open differentials front and rear. So if it senses slip in the front, it'll send power to the rear, vice versa. If it senses slip side to side through brake sensors, it applies the brake on the slipping side. This is really great for on-road driving, but if you're trying to get out of a hole, it kind of just like ends up detuning the engine until the point where like nothing's happening because it's just one wheel slipping and the other's got the brakes on it. Um, I was not a big fan of it. I had a 3.7 with the QT1, uh, and if you can avoid it, I mean, I'm sure there's ways to make them I don't want to offend anybody's Jeep. I didn't have a great time with mine. But uh, moving on, the 4.7 came standard with either uh, Quadra tr Track 2, which is a two-speed uh, transfer case with the same setup, the brake locking setup. Additionally, you could get Quadra Drive 2, which is a really good all-wheel drive system. It's a uh, 2.4.5 transfer case, which is an electronically controlled center differential transfer case uh, that uses the computer and sensors to do stuff instead of the brakes. Much better situation. Additionally, the 5.7 was uh, optionally available, uh, but things really start getting interested in 2006 when they introduced the Overland, which had gone away for one year. They didn't have an Overland for 05, but more importantly, the SRT8 Hemi comes back. In 2006, they put a 6.1 liter Hemi into the uh, WK Grand Cherokee. They sold it as the SRT8, and this is, I wanna complain about something real quick. We're gonna notice a trend where every single Grand Cherokee gets a super high performance model. You had the 5.9, then you get the SRT8s going forward. Why did the WJ never get a high performance? Now granted, Chrysler didn't really have anything crazy at that time. I guess you could make the argument that the HO, no, we're not making that argument. I think the WJ got gypped. We should have got either a 5.9 version or I don't know what. What big Chrysler engine existed at that time? Nothing really. The 4.7, that was the guy. Shame. Moving on to what the WK got, uh, which was a 420, a <laughs> nice horsepower, 5.6 or 6.1 liter uh, Hemi. You got unique front fascias, you got Brembo brakes, and you got a 226 millimeter rear. Those SRT8 uh, Grand Cherokees were legendary. I mean, they shook things up. It was at a time when people were starting to pull away from big, uh, unnecessarily large engines. And as always, Jeep and Chrysler are just like, nah, 6.1 Hemi. <laughs> and I love them for that. Uh, 2007 was a minor uh, change year. The taillights got slightly changed and you now could get standard uh, remote start on your SRT8 and your Limited and your Overland. And it was an option on your Laredo. 2008 saw a minor facelift as well as a bunch of new luxury items, including HID lamps, optional heated seats, serious streaming video, EVIC buttons on the steering wheel, and eight inch DVD screens. This is important because the WK is a transition period from what the ZJ and WJ were to what the WK2 and the WL are inevitably going to be. And stuff like this is where you start to see it. Uh, more importantly about 2008, the 4.7 uh, is updated again, now pushing 305 horsepower. That's a lot of horsepower from a motor that started at like 235. Uh, again, they did this one with a lot of computer stuff and intake changes and a few other little things that I'm sure I'm forgetting. Some of those parts are even swappable onto your pre-02 uh, 4.7 to make it better. But I'm not the guy to talk to that. I think Martin built may have done some of that. That stuff. Uh, in 09, the 5.7 gets its turn to get bumped up. Now it's a 357 horsepower. They did this with a lot of variable valve timing and it actually had better miles per gallon than its predecessor. Additionally, in 2009, Canada got the first S Limited available. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, it's basically 
a SRT8 appearance package. It's an SRT8 without the motor, but it is still kind of cool. Uh, and then in 2010, the United States got our own. So now I'll talk about it. You know, the Canadian version of the S Limited got the 3.0 diesel. Uh, we got the 5.7 Hemi. It's basically all the appearance stuff, the front fascia, the brakes, the door sill stuff, uh, the center stack all out of aluminum that the SRT8 had, but with a normal motor. Uh, but it was a very cool looking Jeep. Uh, it was a $26.95 option, $2,695 option for an appearance package, but if appearances are that important to you, I say go for it. By 2010, the WK is going out in favor of the WK2, which we're gonna get to in a minute before we do. The number sold considerably less than the ZJ and the WJ coming in at uh, 814,075. Now this, of course, it, it sold during the recession and the gas, pseudo gas crisis and, and all that stuff. So the WK uh, had an uphill battle in front of it. Uh, the fun fact for this one is more of an observation. When these existed, we brushed them off as, oh, they don't have a solid front axle and make the three seven and this and that third, but they, these are replacing the XJs, ZJs and WJs as the go-to off-road or beater Jeeps now. And you see it more and more, you're seeing them lifted up, you're seeing them getting used. And I think a lot of like high school kids, whereas when I was in high school, everybody drove a ZJ or an XJ. I think you probably see a lot of these in high school parking lots uh, right now. So uh, we better all get used to them. We better figure out how to make them uh, live up to the Jeep name that was uh, the Jeep way that was paid for them by the WJ, the ZJ, the XJ, and obviously all the CJs and Wranglers uh, and everything else. Moving on to the WK2, which is a vehicle that I find very questionable for a lot of reasons. WK2 Grand Cherokee from 2011 to 2021. Now my first question with the WK2 is why the two? Uh, and I've ranted on this before. If you name something the, the, the whatever two, it implies that it was so similar to the first one that it didn't really bear a whole nother name. It's just like, oh, it's part, you know, it's the, the reboot. And it's not a reboot. It's a complete refresh. It may not be as drastic a change as the ZJ to WJ or WJ to WK, but they didn't keep the same body. They didn't keep the same engine options for the most part. Uh, the interior is completely different and the spirit of the vehicle is completely different. When you get into a WK, lots of plastic, you get the feel that you're in like a, I don't want to say economy SUV, but just you're just in a normal SUV, something that a person just drives. When you get into a WK2, the feeling is very different. I don't own one, obviously, uh, but two of the people I work with uh, own one, and I've got a couple friends that have them, so I ride them all the time, and every time I get in them, I'm like, wow, man. Even this WJ that is the limited, it's got all the heated seats, leather, wood, bro. You get in it, and you're like, this is just a normal guy, you know, normal person's car. You commute in this. When you get in a WJ, like, oh, WK2, you're like, this is a luxury vehicle, isn't it? Which is where they were going. And that's why I harped on the luxury features in the WK, because the WK allowed them to pivot from WJ, solid front axle, rugged, this, that, and a third, to WK2 which was unveiled at the 2009 uh, New York International Auto Show. I don't believe I was actually at that one. It was the first Grand Cherokee to have four-wheel independent suspension. You know how I feel about that. And if you don't, you can probably guess. Additionally, it shares a platform with the third-gen Durango and the Mercedes W166. That is obviously, I know that sounds weird. Uh, the, the Mercedes thing is a remnant of the Daimler-Chrysler merger. They developed that platform together, so they both uh, used it. Um, this is the first time a Grand Cherokee has shared a platform with anything. Some you're going to see a lot more of going forward. As far as four-wheel drive systems, you had your QT1, your QT2, your QD2 from um, the WK, but you also get select terrain, which is like that little knob that's got uh, auto sport, sand, mud, rock. Uh, it's basically all computerized and it changes things like shift points and torque to the wheels, depending on your terrain. And I'm not smart enough to explain how it does that. It just does. Uh, you also have quadra lift as an option during these years, which lets you um, change your ride height, which I think is kind of cool. If you're, you have an overlanding Jeep, I mean, you're not doing hard off-roading, but you want something that's gonna handle fine. And then you get to a light trail head and so you lift her up a little bit. I mean, it's probably, you know, something that's a nightmare when it breaks, but in theory, 
kind of interesting. Now the engine options for the WK2, they replaced the 3.7 uh, Powertech with the 3.6 Pentastar. For all the things that lack on the 3.7, uh, that is how good the 3.6 is. It's a great motor, it's a reliable motor, it's an efficient motor, it's got enough power. I'm a big fan of the 3.6. They lost the 4.7, they keep the 5.7. Additionally, in 2002, we get our SRT8s back. Uh, 2002, it's a 6.4 liter naturally aspirated Hemi, and in 2018, you get the 6.2 supercharged Hemi and there's just nothing to dislike about that. Uh, Donut Media has a really great video of James Pumphrey driving in one and his reaction to driving the 2018 uh, 6.2 supercharged is absolutely amazing. He's trying to be funny and on the way a host would and then he hits the acceleration and you can just literally see he doesn't know what to say anymore. And I think his first words were, I forgot to breathe because <laughs> it's just so fast. It's all, it's full time four wheel drive. So there's no lag. You're not burning the tires. It's just immediate <laughs> down the, down the street speed. Now, I'm a proponent. I'd rather be able to go anywhere than go fast, but it is pretty cool to have a production SUV that I don't even, I don't remember what the numbers are. I didn't write them down in my notes, but they're fast. <laughs> it's friggin' fast uh, and you get there quick. Now that about sums it up for the WK2. I've got significantly less info on them because uh, they they stopped changing things. And what's interesting, you saw the ZJ, what was that for five years, the, six years, the WJ, five years, the WK, five years. And then this one lingered around for 10 years. Um, and it, it, I think it illustrates that they've found a groove for the Grand Cherokee and that's the groove they were maybe trying to get to all along, certainly where they want to be now. It's a lower end luxury SUV. It's still competing with the uh, Explorer, but it can steal customers away from a Lexus uh, and maybe on a good day, a Mercedes just as easily. Uh, and it sells well uh, over 10 years. So far, it's not done selling. They've sold 1,919,630 WK2s. And they're not done selling. It's selling for another year after this. They're gonna break over 2 million WK2s. A fun fact about the WK2 is that uh, in 2009, when Chrysler was facing bankruptcy and they went to the US government and said, hey, you wanna bail us out? The US government said, why should we? And they said, look at this fancy new Grand Cherokee we have. It's gonna sell like maybe, I don't know, 2 million units. And they were like, oh, fine, we'll bail you out again. And they gave them a bunch of money. Now the WK is obviously not the only reason, but uh, uh, one of the ways that, that they were able to convince the US government to bail them out was by showing them the plans to the WK2. Clearly they were onto something, 2 million units sold. Now this takes us to the WL, the future of the Grand Cherokee. In 2022, we are getting a new Grand Cherokee. We've seen spy photos of it all over the place. There have been a ton of rumors swirling around it. I'm going to present you with what I believe to be the most up-to-date information as of right now, though this seems to change all the time. What I do know is all but confirmed is that it will be built at the Jefferson North plant and Mac Ave plant. They have both been retooled for this purpose. That's really awesome. We're bringing jobs uh, back to Detroit. You know, I love to hear that. It's gonna share a platform with the Alfa Romeo Giulia. Uh, it was designed to do that. I believe whatever the next generation Durango is will definitely go on this as well. It's not sharing a platform, again, allegedly with the Wagoneer that was released uh, in a video. We do have a video about that. I'll leave a link up in the corner. They released the official details about the Wagoneer, I don't know what, three months ago now. Um, allegedly it's going to be offered in both two row and three row configurations. They're both gonna be called the Grand Cherokee. I don't know if they'll call it the Grand Cherokee XL. What, what I hope they do, what they should do, is the two row is the Grand Cherokee because Grand Cherokees have two rows. And what does a, what do you call a three row Grand Cherokee? If only they'd done something in like, I don't know, now 2006 to 2010 that can inform, oh, Commander! Call it a Commander! I'm gonna be really annoyed. You guys know I've got a lot of opinions about Jeep. I'm gonna be really annoyed if they, make a, the same vehicle two row and through. It's not the same vehicle anymore. So make a two row list of the Grand Cherokee and bring back the Commander nameplate. I'm a huge fan of the Commander nameplate. Now, as far as engines go, it's highly likely that the two row base model will get the 2.0 turbo straight four that is currently going into the Wranglers. Uh, additionally, the Pentastar is not going anywhere and we have every reason to believe that SRT will get their hands on it, whether it's naturally aspirated, turbocharged, supercharged, I, I don't know. Additionally, the four by LE or what is it? Four by E uh, electric hybrid system that they are putting in the Wagoneer and they're putting in the Wrangler and the Renegade will definitely make its way into the Grand Cherokee at some point, though I suspect the Grand Cherokee will be the last one to get it. That's just what I'm thinking. Uh, we've seen with the Wagoneer. Now the Wagoneer is clearly supposed to be, I think it's gonna be like a hundred grand or something crazy. That is their super high level luxury model. But 
As illustrated in the WK2, they've found a groove for the Grand Cherokee as a high-end, low-end, luxury, high-end, everyman SUV, and that's where they want to keep it. In my opinion, it leaves a hole where the Grand Cherokee used to be as a family vehicle, um, but I don't think they care, and I think they're trying to push the Cherokee into that. There it is, five chapters to the Grand Cherokee covered here. Someday, when the WK2 chapter is closed and the WL chapter has some more words, we will revisit those two chapters to add a little bit of meat to them like we did the other three. So leave that comment down there in the squawk boxes. Which Grand Cherokees have you owned? Which is your favorite? Uh, what do you have to say about any one of the five uh, chapters, where Jeep's been, where it's going. I love to hear from you guys. If you like the video, like the video. That's just common sense. Subscribe to the channel. Maybe even go check us out on Etsy. I have thoroughly enjoyed talking about Grand Cherokees for, well, an hour of record time. I wonder, hopefully I can cut it down so it's not an hour long video. And then I really look forward to talking to you guys down there in the squawk boxes about Grand Cherokees. As always, thanks for watching.